I pray for your staff. I pray for his family. Father, it is, it is a time like none other in our nation. The uncertainties that are, are there, Father, the political division that we see today, Father, the, the protests that just that all seem to want to start off peaceful, but for whatever reason, the rage that Satan puts in the heart of mankind seems to enter in and he, he causes things to turn into a, a, a friend of, of people just losing control of their, themselves and Father, I, I just lift our nation up to you, our president. I lift Joe Biden up to you, Father. I lift our governors, Governor DeWine, and those with that through the, the states. I lift the leaders up to you, Father. You have called us to pray for all men. And, you, and then you begin to list some, and, and those that are of authority. I pray for our, our police departments throughout our land, Father. I pray for their safety. I pray, Father, you just give them strength and wisdom. Our first responders, for our doctors and nurses in our hospitals, we intercede on behalf of others right now. I pray for our nation. Father, a nation whose God is the Lord Jehovah God. It's a nation that will be blessed, and we've seen that over the centuries of of a nation and Father we, we're seeing that fall because we're seeing a great turning away from you and I pray that we would see God's people rise up like never before and Father we'd see lost souls saved we do our part in Jesus name the Phil, let's stand together as we smile a while. Okay, I guess a smile a while. We can just, uh, we're going to go to page 503. We're going to sing our next song. But before we start the music there, just look back at somebody and smile at them and just say, hey, how you doing? All right, that'll keep us from milling around. And So, all right. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Once I was lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation lifted me up from sorrow and shame now i belong to him now i belong to jesus jesus belongs to me not for the years of time eternity joy floods my soul for Jesus has saved me freed me from sin that long had enslaved me his precious blood he gave to redeem now I belong to him now belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. 
eternity. You may be seated. Before Pastor Van brings a message, Miss Linda Covert is going to do a special for us. struggling come to know that in our lives. I tell the message this morning, what does God expect of me? What does God expect of me? I know we expect a lot of God, don't we? I mean, God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. We expect God to be our protector. We expect God to be our provider. We expect God to hear our prayers, to respond to them when we call out on his name. Reminds me of time a little boy asked his mom and dad if he could pray for dinner. And mom and dad were excited that he, that he wanted to pray and ask God's blessing for the food. So the little boy begins his prayer and he says, God, thank you for these pancakes we're having tonight. Amen. And his dad was a little perplexed with the prayer. And he says, Johnny, why did you ask God or thank God for the pancakes when we're having chicken tonight? Johnny said, because I wanted to see if God was listening. 
We expect God to hear our prayers, don't we? We expect God not only to hear our prayers, we expect him to respond to those prayers. We have a lot of expectation of God. And rightfully so, he's God. about our lives and as, as Christians, we need to ask ourselves the question, what does God expect of me? When we sing that song, I am satisfied with Jesus, but the question comes to me as I think of Calvary, is my master satisfied with me? What does God expect of me? great chapter of faith, that chapter that the writer writes about, those characters of the Old Testament, those men, those women, who by faith, who by faith, and over and over he says, by faith, by faith, and we're going to zoom and we're going to focus in on the part of Moses, and so if you have your Bibles and want, want to turn, or you have your iPads, or you have your iPhones and you want to scroll over to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 27, let's read the word of God. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. What does God expect of me? I believe as we look in and focus on we see the life of Moses, we can answer five questions that God expects of us. I think we can settle some issues. How many know we all have issues? You know, sometimes we look at folks and say, man, they got some issues. And it's, and it's, and it's true. They have some issues. But we all have issues. And I want to share with you as we look at our text five issues that we need to settle as Christians today. Five things that God expects of us. Number one, God expects us to settle the issue of who I belong to. We need to know to whom we belong. By faith, verse 24 says, Moses, when he come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses had to settle the issue who he belonged to. By birth, he was a Hebrew. You know the story though, right? We read the first little part there uh, in, the, in verse 23 that his parents feared not the, the commandment of the king. The commandment of the king in Moses' day was that every Hebrew boy that was two years and younger was to be thrown into the Nile. He was to be killed and tossed into the Nile. They didn't want him around. See, the Hebrews were starting to multiply. When they went to Egypt, they went with about 70 folks. Jacob and his clan when it 70 of them. They showed up in Egypt when, remember, Joseph was, was there and he was second in command to Pharaoh and, and he went and he got his father and his brothers and they brought them all there to Egypt and, they, and there they stayed. Well, the new Pharaoh in town and he, he is getting a little concerned because the population of Hebrews is growing. In fact, when they left Egypt, they were 600,000 men plus women and children. Probably well over a million, million and a half People. When you think of that and you think of the Exodus, isn't that amazing how God fed and took care of that many people? Just crossing the Red Sea with a million people is going to take some time. And God opened up the walls and he held them there until every one of them were back on the other side of the Red Sea. And so here we see the story. Moses is supposed to be passed into the into Nile. He's supposed to be, be killed and thrown into the Nile. He was two years and, and, and under. But his parents kept him and held him. They knew there was something special about Moses. He got up and up in age a little bit. And in months, he was years 
yet, but in months perhaps. And he got to where they, they couldn't just keep him hid any longer. So what do they do? They build an ark. Man, the ark is, is always seen as that of redemption, salvation. And they placed him in the ark, and they put him right where he was supposed to go, into denial. Pharaoh's daughter was going to bathe one day, and she sees the baby. She, 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 she pulls him out. She recognizes it's, it's a Hebrew. And so she takes him back, and his sister's sitting there, Mary, and, and says, if you need someone to nurse him, I know someone that can take care of that. And so he's taken back to his parents. His mother gets to take care of him until he gets too old and weaned from nursing. She has to deliver him to there he grows up in the house of Pharaoh. Now he is the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And Moses is next to be king of Egypt. He's going to be the next Pharaoh. That's where Moses is. That's his position. But look at 24. Yeah, but he says, by faith, Moses, when he come to years, in other words, he's old enough to make up his own mind. He's old enough to understand that he's a Hebrew. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That word refuse means that he made a deliberate choice. Moses came to a time in his life that he had to make a deliberate choice. And Moses refused. To be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. If you go back to Exodus chapter 2, you see that it says in verse 10 through 12, and the child grew, speaking of Moses, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, that's his mother, brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren, and he looked on their burdens, and he spied in Egypt smiting, and he one of his brethren and he looked this way and that way and when he saw that there was no man he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand Moses had to settle the issue who he belonged to was he an Egyptian was he Pharaoh's daughter was he to be next king of Egypt was he to be the next Pharaoh or was he a Hebrew the children of God Moses settled the issue by faith he refused to called the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now God expects us to settle this same issue. That's right. Who I belong to. If you came to a crossroad of life when you had to make a deliberate choice between going your way, going the path of sin, doing your own thing, living your own life, following your own plan, or choosing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and His plan for your life. If you've come to that crossroad and you chose Jesus, I want to remind you, we who have received Jesus belong to Him. We just sang the song, now I belong to Jesus. And it's not just a temporary thing. It's for all eternity. Now, if not come to that crossroad. If you have not chose Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you come to it and you chose I'm, I'm going to live my way. I'm going to choose my path. And you reject Jesus Christ. You can. If Christ calls, you can choose to follow him. And I promise you if you accept him, you must accept him as Lord, which means master and Savior. And if you do, you belong to him. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave them power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. That word's techno, that means the children of God. When we come to him, if we believe on him, we become the children of God. We belong. Him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. What? Know you not? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. Ye are not your own. Listen to what he says. For you've been bought with the price. Who knows what that price was? The blood of Jesus. Calvary. You've been purchased by the very blood of Jesus. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We need to settle the issue to whom we belong. We belong to God. Amen. And he expects us to settle that issue. Don't let Satan continually rob you with doubt. 
I remember my teenage years as a Christian. I was saved at the age of seven. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that seven years old at 4172 Marlowe Street on a Sunday evening after church as I knelt down at the bed with my dad and I prayed to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior that he came into my life, that he purchased me with his blood. All I did was by faith open up and say yes. And there's no doubt that was my moment. No doubt today. But there was a time when I wasn't sure. There was a time when I had much doubt in my life. I was in my teenage years, and, and as a, most teenagers, I, I, you know, I wanted to live like a teenager, I guess. I, 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 I was saved, and I knew I was saved most of the time, but my actions wouldn't always show it. And when my actions didn't show it, I'd begin to doubt whether I was saved. In fact, I'd lay down at bed at night sometimes, and Satan would be whispering in my ear, you mean you could do that and be a Christian? And then I began to wonder if I was a Christian. And then many times I'd go in and wake Dad up and, and, and say, Man, we gotta, i got to talk. And we'd always go back to that moment. He'd always take me back to that moment. Him and Mom both. And I remember that moment. And I'd be okay again. But then I'd start doubting. And when I'd start doubting, I'd... Uh, I wasn't doing anything for, for Jesus. When, when he had me in doubt mode, I was afraid to let my light so shine because someone might say, what? You're a Christian? Now, I wasn't a bad teenager, was I, Mom? I didn't, I didn't give him a lot of trouble. But I wasn't shining for Jesus because it was doubt. If you have doubt, here's how you, 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 need, you need to look to God for assurance. In fact, right now, if, if you're right now, you're sitting there saying, man, sometimes I wonder if I'm even a Christian. Sometimes my actions make me feel like I... Now, Satan, you, Satan tempts you, and you feel temptation. The first thing he's going to do to you as a Christian is say, oh, so you're a Christian. <laughs> so that's how they act. And then he wants to feed doubt. So how do we overcome that doubt? Through God and His Word. If you're doubting right now, if you have any any doubt whatsoever, I want to encourage you to pick the God, the, the the Epistle of First John. It's only five little chapters, and read it, and then go back to the beginning and read it again. Because in the Gospel, in the Epistle of First John, He lets us know that He's writing these things at five thirteen. He says, "These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God." So He's talking to us Christians. Believe on the name of the Son. of God. He may know, not doubt, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, use the word for know, the word gnosko, which is a knowledge of God. It means that you, you might have read a book, you might even have read the Bible, you might have a head knowledge of God, but when he uses here is ideon, which is a word that means to know by experience. He says, I want you to know that you're saved. I want you to know that you have eternal life. I want you to know that you're the sons of God, the daughters of God. You need to know beyond any shadow of doubt. And so as he writes those letters to First John, uh, John writes there in the epistle of 1 John, he's writing, and everything he's saying throughout it, read it and read it and read it again. He's citing that that you'll know that you have eternal life. God wants us to settle the issue. In fact, he expects us to settle the issue of who we belong to. We belong to him. Second of all, he wants us to settle the issue of what I know. Verse 25 goes on. Moses, remember he said he's not going to be the, the Pharaoh. He, he, he chose, he, he, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was a Hebrew. He was a child of God. And so it goes on to say, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Reminds us there is a little joy in sin, isn't there? There's pleasure in sin, but it's like short-lived. If there was no pleasure in it, we wouldn't even be tempted to it. But he says, Moses suffered affliction with God's people than to enjoy that sin for a season. Moses had to settle the issue of what he needed to overcome. Moses chose rather, it says. He chose. He chose a lot of suffering with his than the pleasure of sin in the court of Pharaoh. Now, this was a real issue for Moses, a real issue that he had to overcome. He had the 
pleasures of Egypt at his disposal. He lived in the palace. He was in line to be the next Pharaoh. He had come that temptation, and the Bible says he chose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God. I want to tell you, this is a real issue for you and I today. God says this is an issue of what we need to overcome. It could be different for each one of us. The question is we need to be honestly answered is where am I weak? Where am I weak? Huh. It might be your temper you need to overcome. When I was younger, playing in some sports and things, I, I, I was highly competitive and sometimes that led to a kind of hot temper. I can go out and play ball today and not get a bit mad. Of course, I can't really play ball today, so I'm not highly competitive. But I did pray about that. I did work on that because I, I recognized I had a temper that wasn't good for a Christian to display many times. Proverbs 16, 32 says, He that slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Where are you weak at? Maybe it's lust. Samson was called to lead his people, but he proved unreliable because of a weak character. Where are you weak at? Maybe it's money. Now, I'm not just saying money in general. Maybe it's the love of money. You, we all know what the Bible says about that, right? 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, will, with, which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Where are we weak? See, that's how we overcome. That's how, that's how we, we, we overcome temptation. That's how we overcome. We gotta, we, we, we gotta figure out where we gotta be honest. Where am I weak? You may say, Well, look, preacher, I put on the armor of God every day. I place on the helmet of salvation and the plate of righteousness, the belt of truth. I have shoes shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I take the, the word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God with me, and I always hang on to the shield of faith. Well, somewhere in that armor, there's a weak spot. And Satan finds it real quick. And that's where he fires those darts of temptation. That's where he fires those doubts at us. That's where he fires those temptations of sin at us. He looks for the weak spot. So as Christians, if we're going to settle the issue of overcoming, we need to know where we need to overcome. Where's my weak spot? What do I need? Young days, I had this temper, and I needed to overcome it. And I prayed and asked God to help me overcome my temper. And at today, today, I don't feel like that's an issue for me. It's not a weak spot for me. And it doesn't mean that I've overcome altogether. It means I need to look and see where's the next weak spot in my life. Because God needs to help me in that area of life. Where are you weak? Where am I weak? Ask yourself. Ask God. And then ask God to help you overcome. The only way we overcome is by the power of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, God expects, he expects us to settle the issue of what we need to overcome. It's an issue in all of our lives. And he expects us. It's not just that, oh, if you want. No, God expects us to overcome. God expects us, third, to settle the issue of what I believe. It's going to help us to overcome, by the way. Verse 26 goes on to say, Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Moses had to settle the issue of what he believed. Moses decided to believe God at his word. If you look back, at Moses, you'll find that he didn't always have great faith. I know here's, here's our temptation. Our temptation is to say, oh, well, we read these, about these characters in the Bible. We read about Moses, but I ain't no Moses. I could never do what Moses did. Well, yeah, you're right. But if God told you to do what Moses did, and by faith you believed, you would do it. See, Moses didn't have great faith in being. In fact, if you look back to, to Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither hereto, for nor since have thou hast spoken unto thy servant. 
I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. You know what God's answer to him was? Boy, who made the mouth? And God, I'm just saying how my dad would have told me. <laughs> I God said, who made the mouth, Moses? I mean, this is a lame excuse. I'm God. You're mine. I'm calling you. I'm asking you to do this. Do you believe me or don't you believe me? And so Moses had to come to the point that he believed God at his word. And his faith became great. And he became part of the roll call, the honor roll of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. He believed that God's riches were greater than Egypt's. That the reward would outweigh the suffering of this life. God expects us to believe him at his word. We overcome this world by the word of God. 1 John 5, 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. How often are we going to believe Satan's lies instead of God's word? You may say, preacher, I don't believe his lies. I've said that many times. Words are cheap sometimes, right? We believe his lies. You know how I know? Because we don't do what he says to do. We don't do what God says to do. We say, we say instead, I could never do that. I could never teach a Sunday school class. I could never preach a sermon. I could never go and, and tell someone about Jesus. I just don't know enough of the Bible. But God says, go share. You are to be my witness in Judea and Jerusalem and the other most parts of the earth. You're to go and witness for me. You're to share. God says, go do it. And we don't go do it, which means we believe Satan's lie that says we can't over God's word that says we can God expects us to settle the issue of what I believe. God also expects us to settle the issue of what I need to do. He goes on to say in verse 27, By faith he, Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses had to settle the issue of what he needed to do. Moses went back to Egypt. And he went to Pharaoh. And God said, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So on behalf of the great I am, Moses stood before Pharaoh and said, God says, let my people go. Amen. Pharaoh said, who's God? I'm Pharaoh. So what did God do? He sent some plagues. He turned the Nile and all the water of Egypt into blood. He sent frogs Upon Egypt. Moses goes back and says, Let my people go. God continued to send plagues as Moses, Pharaoh continued to harden his heart to the point that finally God hardened his heart. He sent lies. He sent the disease that killed the cattle. He sent boils upon the Egyptians. He sent hell that destroyed most of the crops. And what that didn't get, he sent locusts to wipe out the rest. He sent on the land. Uh, he was going to get the sun god of Egypt. He's showing him that he was the true God. And darkness came along. So dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And finally the death of the firstborn. But each time that Moses went to Pharaoh, Pharaoh would say no, no, no. And finally Pharaoh's starting to get to this point where he's a little bit afraid. I mean, he, these, you know, these plagues are coming upon his people. And so finally Pharaoh says, let's compromise. Let's compromise a little bit. And so he first says, you worship God, that's a, I'm fine with that, but do it here. Moses says, that's not what God said. God said, take the people, take everything you have, and go. And so he sent another plague, and so he goes back in and says, let my people go. Pharaoh said, okay, okay, let's compromise. You can go, but just don't go very far. Just, just, just outside the city limits. Moses said, that ain't what God said to do. Comes back again, and Moses says, Pharaoh says, let's compromise. Oh, but leave your family. You men, you men go worship your God, but leave your families behind. Moses said, yeah, ain't what God said. He said, all of us. All of us. Comes back again, and Pharaoh says, compromise, Moses. Let's 
just compromise the Lord. You go, but leave your possessions here. See, Pharaoh, leave your possessions here. Moses says, ain't what God said to do. God said, take everyone, everything, and go worship him at this certain place. And the death of the firstborn came upon the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said, go, get out of here. Because the people said, get rid of them. They even gave them all kinds of jewelry and every, all kinds of stuff to get, just to get them to go. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and out of bondage. See, God expects us to settle what we need to do. And I promise you, before Nike ever had the slogan, and God said it, do it. Just do it. What do you need to do? I want to tell you something. Whatever it is God wants you to do, there's no room for compromise. We can't compromise with Satan. Because here's what Satan will tell you. He says, oh, go ahead and do it. Don't go too far with it. You know, don't be some kind of fanatic about it. You know, I mean, do what God wants you to do, but just take it a little ways. You don't need to go too far off. Satan will say, oh, it's okay to do it, but don't drag your family and friends into it. You want to go be a fanatic? Go be a fanatic, but leave your family behind. He'll say, go do it, but don't take your possessions. I mean, those are yours. Keep them for you. See, you don't want us to give everything to God. What we need to do is we need to sell out Jesus. Don't give all to God, Satan will say, but we need to sell out. And what that, that, what that means is that whatever he would have us to do, just do it and do it all the way. God expects us to settle the issue of what we need to do. And finally, he wants us to settle the issue of how long I'll be committed. latter part of verse 27 goes on to say, For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses had to settle the issue of how long he was going to be committed. Moses endured to the end. Now, he never got to go to the promised land. You know the story. Moses got a little frustrated. The people were crying out for water. Moses had struck the rock one time, brought water. He went back to the rock. God said, strike it once. And Moses struck frustration. He hit it twice. Don't sound like that big of a deal, does it? But to God it was. Because God said, strike it once. Moses showed frustration. Moses, maybe even in his frustration, thought, I'll show these people. I'll give them water. And he hit it twice. And because of some disobedience, he never saw He never. He saw it, but he never entered the promise. But he endured till the end. He endured till the end. Moses was committed to the task. Remember when God asked Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said, I, here am I, send me. That's who will tell? Who will share? Isaiah says, I'll go. It's in me. It's in me. And then he must ask God a question. How long am I supposed to do this? In verse 11, then said the Lord, how long? And he answered, until the city be waste without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly destroyed. God said, I, that people aren't going to hear you. They're not going to heed to what you had to say. They're going to go on with their lives thinking, hm, sure. But I still want you to share. I want you to tell them the truth. And I want you to do it till there ain't another person left. I want you to do it till there's not a soul living in any house. Man, as I think of what God expects of us, I think he expects us to settle the issue of how long we're going to be committed. How many know salvation is not till death? Salvation was not just for a year or two. At that moment in my bedroom, kneeling at my bed, when I committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, eternal life began at that moment. Salvation is for eternity. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
So what should our commitment be? The same. Throughout eternity. Now, obviously, in the next life, it'll be much easier to stay committed. <laughs> no temptation to sin. No sorrow, no sickness, no disease. No more death. But our commitment is for the rest of our lives and beyond. And beyond. We need to settle the issue. How long? How long will I be committed? Listen, I don't know. God's not said this to me yet. Maybe he said it to you. I don't know. But How long should I go, Lord? I believe he's saying until there's nothing left in America or the world. How long should I go? I'm to be a witness in Judea. That's right where I'm at. See, when he said that to those, those disciples from Judea, but they were all in Judea at the time. Or Jerusalem, excuse me. He'd be witnesses in Jerusalem. They was all sitting in Jerusalem waiting. And so his indication was, you're to be a witness wherever you are. So wherever I am at the time, I'm to be a witness. How long? That there's no one there left to witness to. I'm not to stop. I'm not to quit because things don't look good. I'm not to sit back and say, well, America has, has forsaken God. There's no use. You know, it's been in the times of the greatest sufferings that the church has grown the most. It's been in times when you would think that people would not come to Christ, that they come to Him. How long? Remember, God calls us to salvation forever. So I believe our commitment to Him is to be no less. So many fall short. So many fell out because they don't settle the issue of commitment. Matthew 24, 13, Jesus says, But he that is endure, shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. I often ask this myself this question, who's going to be saved? Jesus said those that endure to the end. Who endure to the end? Those that are truly saved. We need to settle the issue, church, of commitment. Are we committed? And how long is our commitment? To be as long as the commitment that God made with us. The covenant that he made with us through Christ Jesus and salvation. Our commitment should be forever. God expects us to settle that issue. How long I will be committed. So what does God expect of me? We settle some issues in our life. We settle the issue that we belong to him. That we settle the issue that I need to overcome. And the only way I overcome is to be honest with myself and honest when God tells me where is my weak point so that I can overcome. By the power of his word. So I need to settle what I believe. God believe God. And his word, I need to settle what I need to do. What is it God wants you to do in 2020 and beyond? What are we supposed to be doing? It's dynamic often. I mean, what I did 10 years ago is not what God maybe wants me to do right now. Now, I know overall I'm to be a witness. I'm to share the gospel. That, that continues. But in what ways, in what fashions, what am I to settle the issue? Please, please, so we don't fall out and fall away. Let's settle the issue of commitment. We are in it for the whole ride. Amen. How do you settle these issues, you ask? That's a whole other sermon, but I won't preach it today. We settle it the same way Moses did. How many times did you remember reading, by faith, Moses? By faith, Moses. We settle the issues of our life in Christ by faith. And it is also dynamic. It should be growing as we exercise it every day. What's God expect of me? Ask yourself that question. I can only answer it for me. You need to answer it for yourself. Then we need to turn to the power of God. Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing in and through our lives, for how you're working within our church. Father, it's been a crazy 2020. Church has not been like church has been in the past, and that's frustrating to me and I'm sure to many others. 
been weeks when we had to tape ahead of time, but we praise God that we had that ability. Weeks right at the end of the year that we closed out. It, it, it seems Satan really came to attack right at Easter, Mother's Day, Christmas. Those big days that normally draw big crowds. But he did not get the victory. Victory is in Jesus. Father, if there's one here today who has never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, may this be the very moment in their life as Christ draws them that they would say yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. To a rendered life. Father, most of us who are here today, we know that we know that we know you, but time we live our uh, Satan has an easy attack of doubt upon us, and we, and we find ourselves doubting, and when we doubt, we seem to put a bushel over our light because we're afraid to really let it shine. Well, every one of us has something we need to overcome. We have a weak spot in the armor somewhere, and Satan is attacking it, and we overcome it by the Word of God. So we, we must come to that point to come to that point to tell us that we believe you at your Word in totality. We're not to pick and choose. We just take your word as your word. Others, times when I've heard people say, I swear, I swear on God. And I, 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 I swear on his word. And, and, and they don't really know what they even mean by that. But your word is truth. We need to know what we need to do, and we're only going to do that if we're in your word, seeking your face. We need to settle the fact that we are committed for life and beyond. But we don't know what 2021 holds, but you do. We don't know how hard it might be to be committed in the way that we need to be. We need your strength. We need to be in your word. We need to be together. Amen. We might serve you as you desire. As you are. Well, I pray if there's anything that anyone needs to deal with today. These altars are open right where they stand. They can lift their, uh, their voice to you. They can bow in your presence and submission and give whatever it is they need to give to you. Father, whatever it is we need to do in this invitation, help us just do it in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Page 224. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all the guilty stains, lose all the guilty stains, lose all the guilty stains, and sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all the guilty stains. The dying thief rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I go while I see wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, and there may I go vile as he wash all my sins away. Thank you for your presence in the Lord's house today. Isn't it good to know where two or three gather together in his name? There he is also. 
I would love a big crowd. I, maybe right now we don't need it. Maybe that way we can stay spread out. But I am looking forward to the day when these chairs start filling up again like they were back in March before they uh, said that we can't get together for a while. Uh, and uh, just, just because I believe for the church to be the church, we've got together. Now, it may be in the very near future that we've got to gather in houses of five and six at a time. Uh, who knows uh, what might be. But uh, God knows, that's who knows. Uh, but I believe, I don't believe that's going to be the case. And uh, I believe 2021, we're going to start seeing uh, things open back up. I pray that that will be the case. See us, we're going to get together, worship and praise God. But I am so grateful that you're here. I'm so grateful that even though we struggle through live stream sometimes, we are able to do that. And folks who shouldn't be out and about, uh, those that may be sick even right now, can, can view. We, we some weeks have 200 and 300 viewers. Uh, which means perhaps we're getting the word out, f obviously further and to more folks. Even because our best days were 150 here, and, uh, we, and we weren't sending it out any further. Maybe God, not maybe we know God takes what Satan means for evil and can turn it into good. And He's taken He's taken that. We are we are going to be working on uh, for those live stream folks, especially. We're going to work on getting some proper equipment things that we need. We're going to spend a little money. Lord has blessed us. Your tithes and offerings have been good all year. I'm not sure exactly where we're at, Leah, but we had another good year uh, from what I could tell. Even in the midst of everything that was going on, uh, you were so faithful. And so that's going to give us the ability to do some things. And we're going to spend a little money, get cameras, proper type of cameras, and and the things that, that just will make it better uh, as we do this. And uh, and uh, Dan uh, and Diane, they, uh, I, in fact, I know the, one of the fellas, know a couple guys that that's what they do, and uh, and we're just, we're going to get the right stuff. And we're we're just going to make this as the best we can for the glory of God. All right. Now we're not going to spend a fortune. I know you can spend. This, it's like computers. It's like everything else. You can you can go crazy and you know. But we are going to at least. My Bible's not sitting there. We're going to get equipment that can be stationary and there and ready. And, uh, and we'll just pray that uh, when we do that and get it wired up all the right ways, that some of the issues we have will not be issues anymore. But those issues aren't near as important as the issues we talked about today that we need to settle with God. Love you. Appreciate you. We'll not have Bible Sunday school tonight. We're going to give it one more week. We're not going to have men's meeting. Uh, we're not going to have choir practice. Uh, we're going to give it another week, get a few more people healed up. And, and right now, the plan is next Sunday night to start get back into Sunday school. Uh, and hopefully next Sunday, Monday morning, I'm sure when the women are get ready for, for theirs and, uh, and start getting back in things. We'll probably not do choir at least until February. Um, it's right now is the plan, so it won't be no choir practice for the next couple Wednesday nights. We will be at the, on the last Sunday of the month, whatever that date is, Baptist Men's Day. All right, fellas? We probably won't do a men's choir. We might. We'll think about it. Phil and I will pray and talk about it. We might decide to at the, at the last minute. Uh, we may not do a men's choir, but we're going to have a lot of men's singing specials and, and sharing and giving testimony uh, on the last Sunday. We're not going to. I almost forgot about it. I'm glad Phil called and asked about Baptist Men's Day and the, the, my thoughts. And so, boy, I'm glad you did that because I, I forgot all about it. Everything going on. I, and uh, and uh, praise God for this guy right here. Glad that he's back with us today and uh and uh, just love you brother and appreciate you continue to pray for maria she thought she needed to take at least one more week before she ventured out um and uh, others nancy and and billy going this thursday tina i, th I think she's out of the hospital now yes. right? and, uh, so she's finally out of the hospital and uh, and just so many others the mosley family uh, ron bride good good brother in christ and friend uh, in the car accident someone t-boned him he was getting ready to pull into work and, and a big truck ran a red light Hit him right in the left side. And, um, so Appreciate that good piano player that came over. Uh, I go get to that. Thank you, Miss Linda, for sharing with us and being here. And stand for that's right for chauffeuring, and uh, we we do certainly certainly appreciate that. And uh, for our guests uh, that are here today, we're so glad that you've come to be part of this service. God bless you. Stay safe. Uh, on Baptist Men's Day. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> Turn around, though, so they can hear you. That's right. Turn around so they can hear you. I've just missed three weeks. That isn't very much. That's a lot for me. And I've sat here day by day listening to the call one prayer and, and see my brother and sister saw fall ill and sick. 
not to fit on church, and that's just been such a horrible time. But uh, through it all, and before you preach that message today, I know who it belongs to. Amen. Know where, who has me. I know all that. Amen. And I just want to say it's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord again. Three weeks ago, terribly long time. It is, yeah. Paul told young Timothy, I know to whom I belong, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep me until that day. Praise God. Love you all. If I haven't told you lately, I love you. I meant you on one call today, uh, especially us who are here. Look around. There are a lot of folks who are normally here who aren't. Look around. If you spot somebody, I mean, God gives you a, a name, make sure you make contact this week. Text them, call them, send them a card. Do something uh, with somebody. Let's everybody contact at least one person from church this week. Okay, and uh, you can, even if they're here, you can contact one of them. But whoever God lays on your heart, make connection with them so we can keep that connection going, okay? And so you pray about it. God, who am I supposed to call this week? Just say hello. You don't have to have a long conversation. You might, you might if you call certain people because they won't let you off the phone. But that's okay, too, if that's who God tells you to get a hold of. But make sure you connect with somebody. And if you don't have time to call, text. I mean, most, almost everyone has that ability. And, uh, and, and just let's stay connected. We probably won't see most of you until next Sunday. So God bless you. Have a blessed week. And let's 